Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth, which is what we hope to do today. It is June. It is Pride Month. It's Father's Day. There's a lot going on. Uh, And I wanted to do a couple of episodes where we address some of the sexual ideologies that are out in our culture. So today we're going to be talking about how parents can protect their kids from the transgender industry's false ideologies and really that activism that's aimed at our kids to try to change their minds and in many cases change their bodies with irreversible damage on some of these topics. So I've invited my friend, Dr. Jeff Myers of Summit Ministries to join me. He's just published a a free book. You can get this for free at summit.org. It's called Exposing the Gender Lie and uh, How to Protect Children and Teens. So I thought he'd be a great guest to have on and talk about this today. I loved this conversation that we just just had some highlights for me where we talked about how transgenderism is something that affects very real people. There are people who really genuinely struggle with their body, with their uh, gender, and yet typically that's on the rare side of things. But on the other side of things, we have this medical and social scandal. We talk about that. We talk about the history and the trajectory of transgender ideology and how that ideology twists language, distorts reality, forces people to go against their conscience. And finally, we talk about how that ideology ended up capturing our institutions, including even some spaces that would call themselves Christian, uh, even some church spaces. I even referenced a tweet that I saw just today of Derek Webb, who is the former lead singer of the band Cademan's Call, and he went through deconstruction and now has come out with what he's calling a Christian and gospel album that has a song called Boys Will Be Girls, in which he is featured in full drag. So this is where we're going with all of these things, how it captured our institution. So I don't want you to miss anything in this conversation. So here is Dr. Jeff Myers. Well, Dr. Jeff, great to have you back on the show. It is Pride Month, so uh, I was thinking about, you you see all of the different platforms kind of addressing Pride Month. In fact, my kids, everywhere we go, when we just go to stores, when we go to the mall, anywhere we go, especially in the month of June, they are faced with all of the ideologies, and in particular, the activism that's aimed at them in the realm of sexuality and gender, and specifically— I think probably the number one thing that my kids are facing with their friend groups everywhere they go is the transgender activism and ideology. And I wanted to have you on the show today because you, along with uh, Brandon Showalter, have just produced, uh, what would you call this, a curriculum? or It's a, it's a book, it's, but it's a, a book, book that, yeah. we, that we offered for free on the internet. It's been our best-selling book. Wow. But no royalties because we're offering it for free. Right. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. And this is something that just came out. It's called Exposing the Gender Lie, How to Protect Children and Teens from the Transgender Industry's False Ideology. And I really appreciate that you guys have put this together because, as I mentioned, my kids, this is the number one issue they're facing. It's pretty much the number one thing they talk about with all their friends. And it's interesting because my kids have friends who kind of are all over over the map on it. Some are more sympathetic to the gender ideologies that are out there and others are not. And it just seems to be such a topic of conversation all the time. And I do really think it's important that we as Christians protect kids because there is something they need to be protected from. And I'd love to just hear your heart about why you decided to write this book, why now, and um, the heart behind it. Well, Elisa, the, the the reason Brandon and I wrote the book, and Brandon, by the way, is an investigative journalist for the Christian Post, and he's been studying the issue of transgender for a, quite a long time. My core interest was that this is an attack on truth. If you can get children to look at one another and say, there's no difference between boys and girls, then you can get them to believe anything. It, yeah. This is quite literally, this has been the project of... Uh, People who are involved in in critical theory, moral relativism, you know, all these uh, postmodernism, all these different movements converging on university campuses for a long time, it, to, because it, it, if you say, oh, well, the idea of true versus false, that's an idea, so it's a little easier to see that the edges might be fuzzy. The fact that human beings are dimorphic, that we are either male or female, is a binary that is set in biology. If 
you allow that to persist, then you can never ultimately get people to believe that there's no such thing as binary anything at all, good or evil, mm. true, false, just, mm. and just, whatever. And you can never secure your power if that's your goal uh, f uh, for for somebody who's a progressive. So in, in any event, I, I decided this is, a t this is a time where we have to stand for the truth. I didn't want this battle. I didn't want to have to weigh in on this issue. I knew that it would be controversial and that it would, it, a lot of people would be upset, but you know, people are already upset and yeah. it is important that moms and dads know how to talk about the issue of gender and sexuality with their kids and affirm to them that they are made in God's image and that they're made male and female in God's image, that they were not born in the wrong body. That feeling insecure about yourself, especially when you're a teenager, is normal and it's okay. And yeah. then you're going to emerge into adult adulthood stronger for the uh, the issue for having gone through this in this culture at this time. And I think it'd be it's it, this would be a good time to really communicate that there even could be somebody listening to this podcast today that struggles with their gender identity. And I want to be really clear that when we're talking about ideologies and we're talking about activisms and agendas, we're not talking yeah. about individual people that might be genuinely struggling with something uh, like this, that we would have so much compassion for that person and want to walk with that person and love that person and lead them to truth and help them. Um, but there is an activism side of this. There is an ideology that is out there that is really radical, and it is trying to convert especially young people, and it's having, sadly, a lot of success. And as I look out in, into my kids' generation, I think that, you know, for, for some, there is a genuine struggle, but for the majority of what I'm seeing and observing, it really is like a social contagion where it's, it's sort of kind of, in a way, I want to say trendy because it's like you can create who you are, you can, you can identify however you want to, and that gives them a sense of individuality and, and that they can sort of find themselves, quote unquote, so to speak, but they don't, may not realize the what's underneath all of that and the destruction that lies underneath that. So talk a little bit about the the medical element of gender ideology because that's really important, isn't it? It's it's very important. And let me let me affirm the way you're approaching this, Elisa. I'm so grateful for this because we want to somehow as Christians communicate compassion for people who are gender insecure and at the same time stand strong against this ideology that has become a social media contagion that corporations, especially those in the medical field, are using to make money, to make billions of dollars off of gender insecure people, especially minors. Mm -hmm. We have to somehow find a way to talk about the ideology honestly and stand against this, this manipulation this commoditization of young people at the same time recognize that insecurity about our gender is part of the insecurity that that almost all young people face at some point in time. So the medical aspect of this is what is deeply concerning to me. And when Brandon and I wrote the book, we had done a, a tremendous amount of research to discover that the, the medical industry has actually been set up for more than a decade for more than a decade, probably 15 years, to prepare for the eventuality that young people would become more gender insecure and that they could be, then the medical industry could make a lot of money off of using puberty blockers, uh, cross-sex hormones, surgeries, and so forth. This is now, according to market analysis, a multi-billion dollar industry. And of course, this is all entirely aside from companies like Target trying to increase their profits by pandering to LGBTQ people during Pride Month, you know, which which they're doing entirely for profit. OK, this is the, that's the only reason. Yeah. OK, they're trying to in, increase the visibility of their store and make money. That's why they're doing it. And then pretending to be somehow compassionate so that more people will come to their store. But the but the medical industry is this is horrifying. So a lot of young people who are gender insecure as teenagers will go to a gender clinic. These are not hard to find. Uh, somebody challenged me and said they there really aren't clinics that 
that work with young people, I said, well, just go to the Human Rights Campaign. That's the number one lobbying organization for LGBTQ. And just write in Map of Gender Clinics. And a map will come up in the United States of every single place where a child can be taken for some kind of a medical manipulation. So, so it, it usually begins with puberty blockers. Uh, the W path, which are the standards of care that doctors use for people who are gender dysphoric, sp- essentially say that it is medically necessary for children, uh, teenagers especially, who are, have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria to undergo medical treatment. The first step is puberty blockers. The puberty blocker that's most commonly used is Lupron. This is a drug that is used to treat endometriosis in women, to treat prostate cancer in men, and it saves a lot of lives. But it has an off-label, non-FDA approved use as a puberty blocker for children. It literally prevents their bodies from going through puberty. And this is a, a very expensive drug. It for prostate cancer, I, my next door neighbor went through this. I think it was about five thousand wow. dollars. The puberty blocking use of it is more than thirty thousand dollars. In some cases, thirty five thousand dollars for a wow. child. So this is why the medical community insists that this is considered to be medically necessary because that's the designation required for insurance companies to cover it, for Medicaid to cover it, and so forth. But the the effects of this are horrible. It essentially turns, especially young women, into little old ladies at 21, Mm. 22, 23 years of age who have lost the bone density that they need to sustain themselves during their lifetime, and they become sick and extremely vulnerable. And the the medical industry is making billions, billions in profits. Mm. Uh, You know... The narrative out there, and I've seen this in interviews where you have gender affirming doctors and counselors and therapists saying, oh, no, puberty blockers, all they do is just press the pause button on puberty. On puberty. And then, if, you know, that just gives the child some time to make up their mind. And then if they decide they don't want to transition, they can just go off the drug and everything will pick back up where it started. But that's, that's a bit of a, of a mis-untruth, isn't it? That is what we would actually call a lie. A lie. (laughs) It is a flat out lie. That is people from the medical industry telling you things so that they can make a lot of money. Yeah. But essentially what happens with the puberty blocking drugs is you, you have an immediate effect. There are all sorts of things that happen to people who take this drug for legitimate uses. But again, if you're fighting prostate cancer, your goal is to live right? So yeah. it's okay if it causes vision loss. It's okay if it causes uh, blood clots in your brain a little bit because, though you know, we can work with those. But when you're intentionally taking a healthy child and causing these medical abnormalities to take place, it's, it's extremely serious. And it's not something that is easily reversible. And, and here's, and it's for social reasons as well as medical reasons. So puberty blockers would be the first step. Oh, actually, it's not the first step. The, the WPATH standards, World Professional Association of Transgender Health, say that the first step is social transition. So the doctors, the therapists need to immediately start treating the child as if they are the gender they say they are. So pronouns, cha- name changes, talking to the teachers to make sure that they enforce this in the classroom, that all the children line up behind this child's uh, new chosen identity. The second step is, is the medicalization. So using pharmaceuticals, that would be for younger children, puberty blocking drugs, for older children, cross-sex hormones, and then ultimately surgery to the comfort level of the patient. That's what the standards specify. So if you, if you, if you've got a young person who's experiencing gender dysphoria, until they stop experiencing gender dysphoria, you keep moving the treatments in a more and more serious direction. Uh, and it's it virtually uh, all of the young people who use the puberty blockers go on to cross sex hormones. When you use the puberty blockers and then begin cross sex hormones, it's almost guaranteed that the child is going to be sterilized, mm. never be able to have children. Mm. The surgeries are what they call top surgeries. That would be for uh, the removing the healthy breasts of a young woman. That uh, bottom surgery could actually be for boys removing the, the penis and the, and the testicles and then fashioning some sort of a vagina uh, using either 
some elements of the penis or uh, they even use some parts of the colon. Uh, these these surgeries are are horrifying. Horrific. That, horrific. horrific. And it, it is, I believe it is the biggest medical scandal of our oh. century. But, yeah. but it's being encouraged socially. So every one of these clinics, there are 300 some of them that will treat children in the United States right now. Every single one of them sends their practitioners into the schools to train teachers. So the teachers then start treating, they start talking about gender in a different way. So they create a school to clinic pipeline. It is, it, it's unreal that this is taking place, but this is happening in the United States. This is not even to this extent in the countries that pioneered these, this sort of gender treatment, mm. like, such as Finland. Wow. Um, let's talk a bit about the history um, and the trajectory of gender ideology. You have a whole chapter on that in your book. And of course, you start with Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. Of course, we know we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden with really anything that is goes against God's nature and character in our culture. Um, but let's talk about that a little bit. How did we get, I, I, it's just mind-blowing how quickly we've gotten here. Well, at, at least it seems to have happened very quickly, um, especially in the transgender conversation, because I know the homosexuality conversation has been going on for a while, but how did we get here? And, and, and what are those markers of history for us to look at? Uh, I want to first just follow up on something that you mentioned that's extremely important to understand. These two are two different conversations, the homosexuality conversation and the transgender conversation. Right. When someone says they are homosexual, we know what that means. We might think that that's wrong or that there's something that's gone wrong with them, but we know what they're talking about, that they're attracted to somebody of the same sex. In the transgender conversation, a, a person is essentially saying, that they were born in the wrong body. Not that there's something wrong with their body, but that their body itself as a metaphysical unit is wrong. Okay? There's nowhere you can go from there. You're, the rest of your life, you are wrong. The very f most fundamental thing about you, your body that you can know, is wrong. Okay? That's what the transgender movement is saying. So where did it come from? Going back into the 1970s, there and there, the the surgical aspect of this has a history that's horrifying. But I'm going to talk about the academic aspect because that's what I'm more familiar with. So when I was a doctoral student, this was in the early 1990s. We were assigned readings about gender. In fact, one particular reading was called "Doing Gender." It was an academic article, and it said that gender is not related to biological sex. Gender is a performance. Hmm. That we act in the way that we think others think that a person who is like us should act. So that we're performing. So you might, perf you might, you don't really know that you're a male. That's not really all that relevant. But if you're a male, what'll, what does it mean to be a man? Well, you just act out what you think other people think you should be doing if you were to act like a man. So even marriage was was deconstructed in this way, that mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a husband or a wife. They're just people who act as if they think as they think other people would think that a husband or wife should act. So everything is a performance. Out of that ideology came the idea that sex and gender are two different things. So you have your biological sex, but then you have a gender, which is your self-perception. And that is is where this whole idea began. No one ever mm. proved this. There's no way to actually verify that it's so. There's no brain scan that you can do or blood tests that you can do to, to indicate to you that your gender identity is somehow different from your biological sex. It's entirely subjective. It's inside of you, which means then that you're very susceptible to social influences. We are all influenced by stereotypes of the mm -hmm. way we think other people think that we should do things. We are influenced in that way. And in the world of social media, it's on steroids. So and this is how we know that the conversation was really heading off the rails. Gender dysphoria is a real thing, and it would be experienced typically in the past by young men. And it would be a tiny percentage of the population, maybe 0.1% of the population would be young men who have a, an extreme sense of incongruence between their biological sex and their perception of themselves. 
now virtually all of the people who are going through this are young women. And when they're asked, where did you hear about this? Or when did you start questioning this? At least two thirds of them, and according to the most recent study that I've seen in this, point back to massive use of social media. Mm. So they they feel like, oh, something's wrong with me. I'm not sure what it is. I'll go to the internet to find answers, which is a problem that we all have, right? Everybody yeah. goes to the doctor and says, doctor, I am an expert on this because I was on the internet for five I minutes. I know exactly sometimes. what's wrong with me. Yes. And therapists and doctors are usually very concerned about this, but there's an ideology behind it that says you have to treat transgender people differently than you would treat anyone else. Like you would never say to a person who is anorexic, you know, you know, maybe we should schedule you for some some laparoscopy or something, you know, yeah. or, or liposuction. We, Liposuction. I'm sorry. Yes. We wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't say to that person, you know, I think your self-perception is correct. You could stand to lose a few pounds. No, that we would consider that to be cruel yeah. because we know that there's a mental disorder that's going on that's at the root of this. With transgender medicine, the medical community with the potential billions of dollars of profits skips right over all of that and says, yes, all of these young people who have gender dysphoria are also anxious and depressed and have suicidal ideation, but we're going to use medicine to treat the gender dysphoria first rather than dealing with all of those things that would be the underlying causes. You know, uh, I was recently, my family went to Disney in Florida, which we had never done. We'd never done the Disney thing. And I was kind of curious, like, how is this, how is this all going to play out there? Because, you know, the streaming platform, of course, is filled with quite a bit of, um, I would even say, propaganda aimed at kids to try to change their minds on these things. And I thought, well, it'd be interesting to see what the park is like. And uh, largely speaking, it seemed to be, at least when we were there, largely unaffected by some of this stuff. You know, you see a little LGBT pride stand in some of the souvenir shops and, and something like that. But the, the most fascinating thing to me was when we went on the safari at Animal Kingdom. And all throughout the safari, the guide is saying, oh, the males do this and the females do this. Uh, every single animal that we saw, the guide would say, oh, here are the rhinos. Now, the females, they do X, Y, and Z. And the males tend to do more X, Y, Z. And I just thought it's so fascinating how in our society, in our culture, and especially with, with companies like Disney that are trying so hard to really radicalize people into these – this activism, even they, when it really, when push comes to shove, there's, yeah, there's, there's male and there's female. And I guess my question is why, you know, when I'm still stuck on you saying that Lupron is not FDA approved for use as a puberty blocker. Is that what you said? That's correct. And yet, and yet culture, it seems to be trying so hard to go in this one direction, but they betray themselves when they you know, it's not FDA approved or, you know, the, the male rhinos do this and the females do that. What's the connection there? How, how is that disconnect, I guess, being made? I don't, it's so hard to understand. It's very hard to understand. And, and if we're not confused by it, there's something wrong with us mm. because humans are dimorphic. We are male or female. There are 6,500 cataloged biological differences between males and females. It is not just an issue of secondary sex characteristics. Every chromosome in your body is marked XX if you're female, XY if you're, if you're male. There will be a tiny percentage of the population, maybe one out of, uh, I don't know, one out of a thousand people whose secondary sex characteristics are ambiguous and people would be called intersex. But uh, intersex people have been very clear, the societies that help people who have this condition, they do not view themselves as transgender. They right. view themselves as having a biological problem and, the, and they're trying to learn how to live with it. But it is not an issue of a transgender ideology. So, yeah, so we're either male or female. And, and, and that, that's where the gender ideology is, is seen for what it actually is, a 
propagandistic ideology. It's it. Mm-hmm. No one has ever actually been able to prove that gender and sex are different. There's no way that you could actually set about proving it. It's a, it's an assumption that is made, and then that assumption is placed into the standards of care for medicine and in society to pressure people to believe that you can be a male or a female, but your gender is entirely your self-perception. Healthline.com now lists and defines 68 different gender identities. Wow. Well, I want to take a moment and tell you about today's sponsor, and that is Good Ranchers. So today is Father's Day, and maybe you forgot to get your dad a gift. Well, I can't think of a better gift for our fathers out there than American meat delivered right to his door. I love Good Ranchers. We're talking about American grown and harvested grass-fed beef, better than organic chicken, all grown without hormones, without antibiotics. This is the best most high quality meat that you can buy. And here's what I love about Good Ranchers is if you sign up this month, you'll lock in your price for two years. I wish that I was paying today what I paid for my groceries two years ago. Well, that's what you get with Good Ranchers. You're gonna get a two year price lock guarantee. You can choose from several different boxes. We get the Ranchers Classic. We love it. It comes with some steak, some ground beef, and that better than organic chicken. That would be a great Father's Day gift for your dad. Here's a couple of other things I really love about Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers gives back. They donate 10 meals for every box ordered. And, and to date, they have been, uh, they've donated over a million uh, meals to Americans in need. So they're all about doing good while they eat good. It's a Christian company. So it's a win-win. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ALISA for $30 off your first box. Again, that's GoodRanchers.com. Use the code ALISA for $30 off your first box. So, uh, you know, we're, we're talking mostly today about how to protect our kids from this activism, from these ideologies. Let's, let's talk through how language, you know, language is very important, I think. And, and as far as how we've handled this with our kids, and I've, I've said this on the podcast before, but my recommendation to parents is start as early as possible. The thing about gender is you can start even earlier talking about the difference between men and women than you can even bringing in something like homosexuality or same-sex attraction, because you don't even have to talk about the sex act to talk about gender. And that's something you can do as soon as kids le- are learning to talk. Mommy, talk about mommies and daddies, man, woman. And as my kids grew up, I, I think now, I don't know if other parents have had the same experience, but from a very young age, I just, I, they found it very reassuring for me to tell them, hey, by the way, the world's kind of confused. There's a lot of confusion out there, but here's what you need to know. Your hair, your hair cut doesn't make you a boy or a girl. The kind of clothes you wear doesn't make you a boy or a girl. The um, the toys you like to play with doesn't determine whether you're a boy or a girl. Your body determines whether you're a boy or a girl. And then I, I shared with them how I, as a young girl, I there were certain areas where I liked to do the things the boys liked to do more. And then there were other areas, and as I got older, that would kind of flip-flop as I, as I matured and Sometimes I'd be into more, you know, athletic and sportsy things and other times more makeup and clothes and whatever the stereotypes would be. But it's your body that determines your gender. And I think we can start that at such a very young age before we even bring in how confused the world is. And my kids actually found that to be a relief. You could see the relief on their faces because of all the confusing messages that are out there. Oh, it's my body that determines that. So, for example, if my daughter likes to wear more baggy clothes, well, that doesn't determine your sex. Your body does. So I think that that's probably one thing that parents can do really early. What else would you would you advise parents, especially as we talk about um, the the language that's being used? It really like propaganda to distort reality. Yeah, well, the, the language issue is is huge. And I, I did a whole chapter in the book, Exposing the Gender Lie, about that. Uh, Voltaire said long, long ago, and in a very different context, surely if you can get people to believe absurdities, you can get them to commit atrocities. Mm. Now, it's not everyday people who are committing the atrocities in, in, in our society, but it's, it's, 
it, it, it is medical authorities who are committing the atrocities. And in many cases, parents are going along with it because they're being pressured. They're, they're being told, well, look, if your, your child is going to have a 50% likelihood of committing suicide if you don't let them go through our yeah. clinic and, and have all of these gender transitions, which is also a lie, by the way. It's a horrible lie. Yeah. And the studies simply don't show this. In fact, they show that when people complete the medical transition process with surgery, that they have a 19 times higher likelihood of suicide. Yeah. So it's exactly the opposite of what we're being told in the culture. So but what, 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 what do you do with your children? Uh, I think your approach is exactly right. Affirming, what is it, you know, God made you to be a boy. God made you to be a girl. Uh, we don't want to play into the stereotypes. A girl who likes to play soccer is no less a girl, okay? Yeah. A boy who likes to play music or create art or fashion or whatever is no less a boy. Right. We have to set aside those cultural stereotypes and say, we're going to focus on how God made you. You weren't born in the wrong body. You were born in the right body. God made you just the way he wanted you to be. And it's okay if you're interested in all different kinds of things. But the, the, the reason the issue is, comes down to language is because people have come to believe, based on the gender lie, that all humanity falls on a spectrum with extreme masculinity over here, extreme femininity over here. So that if you're somewhere toward the middle, you might actually be the opposite sex. I've had students who've come to Summit Ministries tell me, you know, like one young woman who was in engineering, uh, wow. Uh, you know, at my school, people said, well, you're a girl and you're interested in engineering. Maybe you're actually a boy and you've been born in the wrong mm. body. That is a stupid, cruel thing for peers to say to one another. But our, our children have to acknowledge that's probably going to be said. So sh she needs her parents to affirm God made you as a woman who is going to be an incredible engineer. I have yeah. a daughter who is a helicopter pilot, okay, which would typically in the past have been a male thing to do. She's a wonderful woman who flies a helicopter. Uh, I, what, my, one of my daughters, when she was two, she was extremely verbal, so she's almost ready to turn three, and, she's, and she told me that when I turn three, I'm going to be a boy. Mm. And I, I was thinking, what is going on? Why, mm -hmm. why would she say that? Well, all of the families we were friends with, their younger kids were girls and their older kids were boys. And she had just decided, she realized, oh, when I turn three, then I will become a boy. And, I, and so we talked about it. I tried to talk with her, affirm, no, God made you to be a girl. You're wonderful as a girl. And finally, she turned three. And I said, well, you didn't become a boy. She said, <laughs> She said, not yet. <laughs> that's, she's so smart, though. She's thinking it through. She's observing, you know, the older kids are boys. But that's yeah. such a great point because I think um, another advice to parents, too, and again, none of us do this perfect. We're all kind of figuring this out in real time as we're in it together with what's going on in our culture. But I think that for all of us as parents to just not freak out. Right. There's going to be some confusion yeah. with younger kids, especially with I mean, unless you just completely keep them locked in your house with no media at all, they're going to be exposed to some of this stuff. And there might be a little bit of confusion, like uh, maybe at five years old or six years old saying, hey, what if I'm really the opposite sex? And a good advice, I think, for parents is not just don't freak out, but maybe yeah. ask some good questions. Why do you think that? What What is it that makes you think that you're a boy? But I, I do want to ask you this, too, because this involves kind of this language component too. And I've, I don't know if I've ever asked anyone this on the podcast, but it's something I think about a lot in relation to this conversation. And that's that, you know, we, of course we say we're not going to, we're not going to go with stereotypes. You know, some girls like to play with cars, some boys like to play with dolls. Um, but at the same time, there is something innate to men and women. And as you mentioned, which is femininity and masculinity, how do all these things intersect? Because I want to be really careful to tell my kids, hey, it's your body that determines your sex and your gender. Um, but there, but that also doesn't mean you should start purposely acting like the opposite sex. And what does that mean? So what is, what is the component of masculinity and femininity in your view as that would relate to the biology of our yeah. gender? Well, there's so much to process here. 
you, you can imagine if I were to hear my daughter say, at age three, I'm going to be a boy. Well, today I would be encouraged to freak out, take her to a therapist. My right. daughter is actually born in the wrong body. Can you help? And they will, they will work with even tiny children and then put you on this process of medicalizing and all of this stuff. Freaking out is, is one of the things that's the real danger for parents. So in our case, it was just, you know what? She has this view. I can understand where she got it. Let's just live our lives. Let's live our lives. She doesn't have to, nobody has to pick. Nobody has to, you know, say, well, if she, if she thinks she's going to be a boy, then I need to get her all boy clothes. I need to get her, a, you know, and these products are actually available on the market. I know it's shocking to talk about, but a crocheted penis, you know, that she can wear in her, yeah. her pants. It's just, it's unreal. The things that parents do to traumatize their children. Mm. Now, the ones who have the trickiest time with this are the children who have gone through some kind of a trauma. Mm -hmm. That could be that could be uh, childhood abuse, could be sexual abuse, could be sexual molestation, could be early exposure to pornography, could be the divorce of parents that traumatizes a child or the death of a loved one. All different kinds of things can cause childhood trauma. Those unresolved childhood traumas move into all sorts of things when children are going through adolescence, usually anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, but gender identity confusion is certainly one of those things that would be part of it. It would be a comorbidity of that kind of trauma. So mm. helping our children understand masculinity and femininity. Sorry, there's so many different directions on my mind. Is I know, I know. It's different it's... places. Uh, God made us male or female. Well, what, what does that mean? It's both a theological and a biological reality. There are, as I mentioned, all of these differences between males and females, 6,500 catalog differences. Let me just give you one illustration. And to any parent, this is probably going to be a, a helpful breakthrough. Our, the cells in our eyes are different. Now, there are two kinds of cells in the eye. We have rods and cones. Rods are the sort of cells that focus on contrast and motion. Cones are the sort of cells that focus on color and texture. Girls, biologically, have a preponderance of cones. Boys, biologically, have a preponderance of rods for the cells in their eyes. We literally see the world differently as male or female. Wow. Uh, you know, when my kids were little, I bring them to church with, with coloring books or, you know, just pads of paper and colored pencils. And the boys only ever needed black and red. Like they used the black ones to make tanks and airplanes. And they made, <laughs> they used the red ones to make the blood spurting out of the people who got right. shot. <laughs> right. And the girls, meanwhile, are drawing their house and flowers and their family yeah. and things like that. That wasn't anything I programmed them to do. I didn't tell them what to draw pictures of. They didn't, they, they weren't going to show the pictures to me to try to get my approval. It was just, they were seeing the world differently because their eyes are literally created to see things differently. So it's super important for our children to understand not only that we're male or female, but that God designed male and female to harmonize with one another. God made boys to see motion and contrast, to be moving and going out into the world and being a, you know, a, a, an explorer and, and moving into a, a place where they can protect other people and stand for truth and fight against evil and injustice. And God made women to stand for truth as well, but more by being life givers uh, to breathe life into other people and, and create community. Every single study that's ever been done on men and women in the workplace verify these results. And there have been thousands of these studies that have been done. So the biology and the theology intertwined, but it's important to understand that God made us to be different on purpose. I'm putting my hands like this just to remind myself that it's sort of like two pitches of a roof. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have this pitch, this one would fall in because it's too heavy. But it's funny how you take two pitches of a roof that are both very heavy and you lean them against one another and they actually create strength. Mm. That's how God designed male and female and har that they harmonize together is the goal. How do you as a girl relate to boys? How do you as a boy relate to girls? This is actually a much trickier thing for children than we sometimes will admit. And it's something that we can help disciple them on. 
You, you talk in the book about how trans ideology captured our institutions. Looking out, we see all the way down to preschools and kindergartens and elementary schools, all the way up through, of course, the universities, which, you know, we would expect to see a lot of it there. But it's everywhere. In fact, I'm looking at Twitter right now, um, Jeff, and I'm looking at the Twitter feed of Derek Webb, who famously was the lead singer of Cademan's Call back in the day and then went through deconstruction. He even compared deconstruction with what Martin Luther did. He said Martin Luther was deconstructing. That's what we're doing. But he's just posted today a photograph of his latest video shoot. Now, he's saying this is a Christian and gospel album, um, and it's a song called Boys Will Be uh, Girls. Boys Will Be Girls. And in the video, it's a photograph of him uh, dressed up in drag. And this, the reason I'm, I'm not just, you know, saying that to, you know, to say, hey, look at that. Yeah. But it, it shows how deeply embedded this has gotten into our institutions to where it's actually in spaces that would be called Christian. Now, I, there's nothing Christian about this, of course, but there are a lot of people deceived by this, even in the church, who think, well, this is somebody who's making a Christian album. He was recently just on staff at a church, even as someone who does not identify as a Christian person anymore. And basically, with a song called Boys Will Be Girls, this ideology is everywhere, including spaces that would be called Christian and even churches. So talk about how that ideology captured our institutions to where it's even being taught in kindergarten. Yes. So, so a lot of this goes back to the books that people have in, or that schools have in their libraries and the books and teachers are encouraged to read to their children to break down any concept of their biological sex having relevance to their lives. They're encouraged to see themselves entirely based on their own self-perception uh, at least that's the initial ploy. If you decide later on, you know what, I, I actually have a girl's body and I'm tired of being a boy and so I want to go back to being a girl, you will not get that same level of social support. So mm. detransitioners find yeah. their road to be very difficult. Derek Webb's an, you know, an, an interesting example. If he decides, oh, you know what, I actually do believe in Jesus and all this was just a terrible mistake – He's going to experience such withering criticism from all of the people who benefit from him affirming their worldview mm -hmm. that it will be extraordinarily difficult and alienating were he to ever go back. Uh, trying to help in the church, help people create a path back is, is I think, going to be an interesting problem that we'll have to mm -hmm. face. We will have to realize there will be young women coming to church who were talked into mutilating their bodies, yeah. and they're full of regret and suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, young boys, similar situation. So the, we have to decide as the body of Christ, will we learn how to embrace these people, walk alongside of them in the midst of their suffering, and give them hope mm -hmm. when they might actually be very uh, deeply confused and broken? That, that's such an important point you just made because – and I want us to think about this a little bit because I've thought about this as well. As you've just so succinctly articulated, we are going to see people in our churches who have maybe done years of hormone therapy or who as a teenager – went on puberty blockers, changed their mind, and then they're living with the consequences of that. And that, as you so um, wonderfully pointed out, that's going to take a lot of uh, willingness to walk through these issues with people, disciple them, have things in place. But also, it's going to take a church who's willing to not judge on first sight, because we are going to have people coming into our churches who might look, they're, they're wearing the scars of, on their, on their outward yeah. appearance of these, of years of hormone therapy and this or that. And it's going to be very important that we don't judge people just by the way they look when they walk in, because it could be, like you said, somebody who maybe hasn't met the Lord yet and needs to hear the gospel and encounter the, the life-saving and soul-saving gospel that they'll hear in church. But also it could be somebody who's already a Christian and is bearing the scars in their physical appearance of all of those years of those treatments and maybe even surgeries and, and whatever else might have been done. So it's going to take a church who's not just willing to put something in place and disciple and walk with people, but also to to not just judge on appearance, because there's going to be probably a lot of people, in the, especially I would say in the next 10 or 15 years, that um, are going to just on site look like, you know, you're not sure where they're at. And, and that's going to be something the church is going to have to navigate. No question. 
there are a couple of aspects to this that I would love for pastors and people involved in ministry to be thinking about. One is spiritual transformation is real. People can change. We're not stuck with what our society says is the important thing right now. Trends come and go. But the Spirit of God changes us. We can experience that transformation. Uh, my friend Christopher Yuan, who speaks here at Summit Ministries, used to identify as a gay man. And if you ask him now, do you identify as a gay man? He said, I identify as a child of God who was saved through Jesus Christ. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's my identity. There's also an aspect of therapy that I believe fits in here. I, I think as Christians, we need to be increasingly thoughtful about the fact that a lot of people are dealing with childhood traumas where a Christian mm -hmm. therapist who believes in the Bible can actually help them uh, deal with those underlying childhood traumas. For for young adults, for especially for adolescents, we're finding that s somewhere between you know, 75 to up maybe you know, 90%, maybe even more of young adults who deal with those core childhood traumas resolve their gender dysphoria by the time they finish puberty. So there, there will be an increasing role for people in the church to be trained as therapists, not to embrace uh, the rhetorically named gender affirming care, but to focus yeah. on helping people be at peace with being in their body, but also dealing with those things that traumatize them and make them feel confused. What can Christian parents do as it would relate to public schools? We talked about how this has captured our institution, uh, but I meet regularly when I go speak at conferences. I meet public school teachers, um, people who work in public schools, bus drivers, um, and they're feeling the pressure yeah. to capitulate, to use the pronouns, to put the sticker on their door. Um, people are being threatened with losing their jobs. What do you see being the relationship? I mean, should should we just completely leave the public schools? Or I know that's not an option for everybody. What should concerned citizens, Christian people do uh, as it relates to what's going on in the public schools? So uh, uh, my children were schooled in a variety of different formats from charter school that focused on classical to homeschool to even in public school. And I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that I would not ever, if they were to grow up again, if I had younger mm -hmm. children, I, I just would, I, I wouldn't put them in there now, I, I, but you're right. I, well, so the Christian school, you know, some Christian schools cost $18,000 a year, you know, some are less, but it, it, it's really difficult for a family to try to imagine that there would be an alternative that they could afford. A lot of families are moving toward homeschooling. I want to encourage all of those alternatives. Alternatives make every educational system better. When yeah. People are choosing something other than the public schools. The public schools have to improve. So that's important to understand. Uh, so you've got people who work in the school, they're teachers, they're bus drivers or whatever. It's going to be really important, Elisa, and this is probably a whole other conversation mm -hmm. for them to assert the significance of their conscience. Mm -hmm. All right. Because a lot of people say, Oh, no, uh, everybody gets to decide their own gender, but you, because you work in the school, you must affirm the way we are saying it must be approached. So yeah. the only people who don't get a choice are the ones who are working in the environment trying to deal with all of this mess. Yeah. So they have to be able to say, as a matter of conscience, I, I'm going to refrain from giving you my pronouns. As a matter of conscience, I am not going to read this book to the children in the class. Conscience is protected speech, okay? Nobody, nobody can make you think thoughts that you don't think. That's a violation of the Constitution, and the legal protections are there. But you have to be able to say, I understand this is very important to you. I understand that you feel like this is going to make society better. In my conscience, I cannot grapple with that. I'm not there. And as a matter, I just ask you to respect my conscience as well as respect what you consider to be the identities of other people. 
That's great advice. And this was actually uh, played out, and I, I think it actually ended up working. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Philadelphia Flyers hockey player, uh, Ivan Provorov is his name. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but um, he didn't participate in the pregame warmups when the team was going to wear the pride-themed jerseys and have the rainbow tape on their sticks. And um, I, I watched the the news footage of them asking him about it. And he just made the most simple statement. And it goes along with what you just said. He kind of appealed to conscience. He said, I respect everybody and I respect everybody's choices. My choice is to stay true to myself and my religion. That's all I'm going to say. And you know what I thought was so... um such a great example of what he did is that really is all he said. They tried to come back around. Like they asked him, a few reporters asked him about the game and he answered and then someone else tried to bring this back. And he was just like, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to comment further. And what was so interesting, Jeff, I followed the story for a while. In fact, Natasha and I recorded an Unshaken Faith podcast episode just about this because it was interesting to see that it started, ca started catching on everywhere else. Other players started declining to wear the jerseys. And then whole teams said, it's okay, you don't have to wear the jerseys. And it it was a very interesting story to follow. And that's really all he said. It was basically, he was just saying, look, I respect your right to have your choice. This is my choice. I have to stay true to myself and my religion. And, um, and I thought he was going to be canceled. I thought, oh, goodness, this guy... But it was almost like the activists kind of didn't know what to do about it. There's some, there were some hit pieces and things like that. But for the most part... It worked. So I think that's really good advice. Um, well, as we close out here, I want to I want to ask you a question because there could be people listening going, gosh, why is this such a big deal to you, Christians? Just live and let live. Let people do what they want to do. Why do you think that we think that the biblical view of gender, body and sex matters so much? Well, it matters for the flourishing of society, that males and females learning to be confident in how God made them to be is is important. It's important that, well, I'm thinking of young men. I've got a book on my desk right now called Manhood by Senator Josh Hawley. It's the kind of book that you think 30 years ago, why would you ever have to write a book like that? It's actually talking about what are the biblical aspects of masculinity? What is it we want to raise our boys to be? What is it we want to raise our girls to be? We want them to be strong. We want them to be confident. We want them to feel comfortable in their own body. We want them to, to believe that they were born in the right body, that God has a plan for their lives, and that even when they can't see it, they're going, getting stronger and it's, it's, it's going to turn out fine. Okay, so we've got to do all of that. But I, I really wonder... Uh, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here because this is it's such a difficult th thing to, to figure out how to process. I think we have to also recognize that there this is an attack on the freedom of thought, the freedom of conscience, mm. the freedom yes. of speech. So the goal of a lot of people in Pride Month is just to say, you know what? In the past, you got bullied. And we're not going to, you know, you're not going to be bullied anymore. And I'm going to be one to stand up for you. But it's so much more than that. Every single year, we see more and more people saying, no, that's not enough. You must think my thoughts. You must think the way I think. Otherwise, you will be shamed. Otherwise, you will be canceled. That's when it starts to press into. It's no longer just this is a person's individual choice. It is no, this is my choice. And you you must acknowledge my fantasy world mm -hmm. up against reality. Otherwise, I will harm you. That's where the tide is starting to turn, and we just can't have that happening. Not for our kids, not for ourselves. Any final words for Christian parents who are trying to navigate this issue with their kids? I. I I would invite anybody who's interested in getting a book like Exposing the Gender Lie. It's very short, it's just 60 pages with about 100 footnotes documenting everything that we talk about. But that book is at summit.org slash protect. You can download it for free. You can print it out. You can forward it to people. I mean, members of Congress have this, state legislators across the country. Lots of different people are looking at this and using it in their decision making. But I would, if I were a Christian parent, I'd turn directly to chapter five on a biblical view of masculinity and femininity and then read the frequently asked questions. Your advice earlier, don't freak out, is one of the most important things to understand. <laughs> 
that cultural trends are overwhelming and you can't imagine that it could be any other way than the way it is right now. But it's a fleeting thing. What we, what we understand as Christians is that God has made us, we are his, we're made in his image. That never changes. Well, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Jeff Myers. Don't forget to get this free book on summit.org that's exposing the gender lie, how to protect children and teens from the transgender industry's false ideology. And I did want to say a word to parents who may have heard us just saying, you know, don't freak out. Maybe you think, well, I already did freak out. I've blown it. That book is closed. Uh, The book is never closed. Even if you have freaked out, if you feel like you've blown it, model repentance to your child. Model the humility of going back and saying, look, I I reacted wrongly. Please forgive me. This is is a difficult topic for all of us. Can we try this again? Uh, Because you, you can't harm that relationship as long as you go back with humility. And so don't worry if you have freaked out. That book is not closed. And we will all be praying for one another in this conversation that God will give us wisdom and give us grace to navigate these issues with the very real relationship that we have in our real lives. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Jeff Myers. Don't forget to pick up his free book on summit.org that's exposing the gender lie. Such a great resource for Christian parents. I hope you really got a lot out of the episode today. I also want to thank our sponsor, Southern Evangelical Seminary. It's always such a great joy for me to tell you about SES, who helped shepherd me through my faith crisis over 10 years ago. You can go to ses.edu slash Elisa and download a free ebook there and figure out what they're all about. I'm looking forward to taking classes again with them in the fall. Just finished my philosophy class in the spring and can't wait for the fall. And as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time.